Bismillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. We begin by mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and his blessings upon our beloved, upon our role model, upon the man we give up our family for, upon the man whom we should love more than anyone in the world, including our own selves. We ask Allah to send upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his peace and his blessings. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. When we talk about Medina, brothers and sisters, in the community of Medina, there were not just all Muslims, there were some non-Muslims. From amongst the non-Muslims were Jewish tribes, among them were the Yahud of Bani Al-Nadir, and another group which is Bani Quraida. These are two examples of some of the Yahud that were at Medina at the time. Now, do you think the Yahud knew the Prophet ﷺ was actually a Prophet? And the answer is absolutely yes. How much? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Allah best described it as the Yahud at that time, Bani Nadir, Quraidha, especially the ulama, the scholars, they knew Muhammad is the messenger of God the same way they knew whom their children were. You see how amazing Allah described their knowing of the Prophet? They knew the Prophet the way they knew their own children. Oh, so for sure they believed, right? This is like, it's no brainer. Brothers and sisters, even though they were passionately waiting for him, even though they were firmly believing in him, even though they were publicly talking about him before he came, but when he came, brothers and sisters, they rejected him. Complete rejection. May Allah protect us and grant us wisdom. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. All of them rejected to the most part, yes. However, some actually believed. Amongst the ones from the Yahud who believed was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Salam. He was one of the scholars of the Yahud. Look what he says. He says, I went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to confirm a few pieces of information. So when he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asked him the questions, the Prophet answered, then Abdullah ibn Salam was completely comfortable to declare his Islam. So he said, O oh Rasulullah, I bear witness, there's no deity worthy of worship, but Allah and you, O oh Muhammad, is God's messenger. Allahu Akbar, Abdullah ibn Salam, who used to be a scholar of the Yahud, has now accepted Islam. May Allah make you all have that statement as your last state when you go and return back to Allah. May Allah make us die upon La ilaha illallah. Say Ameen. This is a great ni'mah from Allah. But then Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a scholar of the Yahud, he describes his people at that time. He says, Yahud qawmun buht. The thing about my, the Yahud at that time, he says, they mix truth with falsehood. That's their thing. Many of them do that. So he tells the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I am worried that if you go and you ask them about me after they know I became Muslim, they will accuse me that I am a loser, that I am a nobody, that I am a traitor. They will say stuff like that and say, I'm ignorant, I don't know what I'm talking about. So the Prophet ﷺ, he does not tell the Yahud that Abdullah ibn Salam accepted what? Islam. He brings the Yahud to talk to them and try to invite them to Islam. So the Yahud do not know that Abdullah accepted Islam. So the Prophet asks them, what do you guys think? How do you guys view Abdullah ibn Salam? They said, oh, Sayyiduna wa ibn Sayyidina wa khayruna wa ibn khayrina. He is our leader and the son of our leader. He is the best amongst us and the son of the best amongst us. He, the Prophet said, what if I tell you, that's, what if you are told Abdullah ibn Salam accepted Islam? They said, whoa, 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 may God protect him. May God protect him. Then who comes in? Abdullah ibn Salam. And he tells to the Yahud, and I bear witness, Allah is the only one worthy of worship, and this man, Muhammad, is God's messenger. They all said, Sharruna wa ibn Sharrina. He is the worst amongst us, the son of the worst. They cursed the, him and his father, who was not even present. May Allah protect us. Abdullah ibn Salam said to the Prophet, see that what I was worried about. So some believed and some did not believe. Some believed and some did not believe. Then brothers and sisters, with all of that being said, there were 
peace between them and the Muslims. No fighting. The Prophet ﷺ never harmed them. The Prophet ﷺ never betrayed them. They settled and everything, alhamdulillah, was fine. However, brothers and sisters, after some years, after a few battles the Muslims have fought, what happened to Banu al-Nadir? Bani al-Nadir started to plot against the Prophet ﷺ. Really? Why would they do something like that? Remember, jealousy and envy. And they breached the peace. How? They tried to kill and assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. In one narration, they came and they were hiding knives. So when the Prophet would to approach, they would stab him and kill him. So then Allah revealed this to the Prophet ﷺ. And with Allah's mercy, the Prophet was able to escape. And his life was saved by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's only common sense. When you have a peace treaty with someone and you commit treason, it's a big, 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 big problem that you just caused. And there's a big penalty that follows. The Prophet ﷺ, what does he do, brothers and sisters? After Allah saved him, he, the believers besieged an nadir and they had to e evacuate their fort. And the Prophet ﷺ was kind enough. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, in their case, he will not kill them. If you go up and look at the country that we live in today, when there is treason, you see some of the optional penalties. But the Prophet ﷺ, in this situation, he chose to spare their lives and told them to leave and take whatever assets they can take that will fit within one camel. May Allah protect us and grant us wisdom. Amir Rabbil Alameen. Oh, did the Prophet fight Banu Quraidha? Remember the other Yahudi tribe? Remember there were two that I mentioned. The Prophet ﷺ did not. Why? The Prophet teaches you and I a lesson. If one person from that tribe, of that person from that religion or whatever the case, these are Yahud and these are Yahud. When they breached, the Prophet didn't fight both. Allahu Akbar. You see that? And this is the Prophet showing the world what faithfulness means. And the leader of Bani Quraidha, he affirmed that and he says, we never spoke to Muhammad except that we saw faithfulness, wafa'an, wa sidqa, truthfulness. May Allah make you have these two traits. Say Ameen. Okay, Alhamdulillah, everything is great. Muslims settled, things happened, and one of the rulings around the third year, around this period of time when Banu, Qay Banu Nadir left, Allah revealed an obligation, the prohibition of alcohol. The Muslims were not used to that. Muslims used to drink, yes. It was not prohibited yet. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran and now the Prophet is preaching it to the believers. Allah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, O you who believe. You know what does O you who believe means? O you who trust Allah that Allah will not tell you to do something except that it's good for you. O you who believe. What does it mean? O you who will hear and obey Allah. O you who believe. O oh, you who trust the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that what he tells you is from God, the one who manufactured you, the one who knows what's best for you, O oh, you who believe. So are you all gonna hear and obey inshaAllah? Inshaallah? Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, O you who believe. Yes, ya Allah. Innam al khamr. Allah says indeed alcohol and its similarities of intoxicants. What about them? Allah says, rigid, what? Evil, it's filthy. Rigid, min amal shaytan it's one of the tools the devil uses, one of the devil's ultimate tool, one of the top of the top things he has in his you know, case to use against us and destroy us from young to old, men, women, Muslim, non-Muslim, intoxicants, drugs, alcohol, and things of that sort. Allah says, this is rigid from the tools of the devil. So what should we do? Fajtanibu. Allah says, so shun it and be away from it. Fajtanibu. Don't even, Allah doesn't even say go, don't drink it. Be away from it. Be away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I know to some of us it might be difficult to leave the drinking and leave the drugs. I understand. May Allah make it easier for all of us. Say Ameen. But you need to strive. Allah will never make something haram on you except that you can leave it. Do you trust Allah? I don't see myself quitting this and quitting that. Wallah, you can. Because Allah will never tell you to do something which you cannot do. Allahu Akbar. And if you cannot do, you always find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving you a rukhsa, giving you a way out. For example, 
I cannot pray while I'm standing. But Allah said to pray. But in this case, if you have issues with your leg and so on, you pray while sitting. Allahu Akbar. But in this situation, avoid drugs, avoid alcohol. You know to what extent? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allahu Al-Khamr. Allah has cursed the alcohol, the drug itself. These intoxicants are cursed by Allah. Then Allah says, be away, right? So the Prophet says, Allah cursed the one who buys it. Allah cursed the one who sells it. Brother, before you proceed, what does curse mean? What is it? Like, okay, curse. Like, what does it mean? Meaning, no mercy will be shown. Lack of rahmah. Okay, make it simpler for me. Allah's mercy is that He makes you, for example, be blessed with provisions. Allah's rahmah to you, for example, is that He forgives your sins. Allah's rahmah to you means He makes your life better. The quality of your life becomes better when Allah showers His mercy upon you. Rahmah from Allah means forget dunya. Akhirah, Allah enters you into paradise. All of that is jeopardized if you deal with this. You see how serious that is? So Allah cursed the intoxicant, the alcohol itself, the one who buys it, the one who sells it, the one who manufactures it, the one who serves it, and the one who carries it. All of them. I don't drink it, it doesn't matter. May Allah protect us, say Ameen. You know what Allah ends the verse with? لَعَلَّكُمْ Continue. Who knows? لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So perhaps you will attain success. Allah is telling you, being away from this is a major step towards success. Allahu Akbar. Uthman bin Affan, an authentic narration. He said, beware of this. All this from the life of the Prophet that we learn. He says, be away from this. إِنَّهَا أُمُّ الْخَبَائِثِ these drugs and alcohol and intoxicants that makes you, your mind absent are the mother of all evils. Then he gives you an authentic narration, an example of a man. That man was cornered in such an ugly way that he was told, he was a devout Muslim, a good person, but he was forced into what? To doing one of three things. He was told to either kill that child or you commit a zina with this woman or you drink alcohol. So the example Allah provided for us here through this authentic narration of Uthman bin Affan, the man said, I will just drink what? Alcohol. So in the authentic narration, it said the man drank alcohol until he got drunk. So he committed zina and killed the boy. May Allah protect us. Just today, just today, I got news of a whole family that died from a drunk driver. May Allah forgive us and protect us. I know I'm emphasizing very much on this, that's wallahi, it is targeting us from east, west, north and south, front and back, yes or no? Especially to the brothers, yes or no? You go watch all these entertainment taking place from football to basketball to the Champions League to all these leagues. Who is one of the main sponsors? Alcohol companies. They want to go give your scholarship over what? Wallahi, at the expense of our lives. May Allah grant us wisdom and may Allah allow us to have insight and not just sight. Say Ameen. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. So my advice is what Allah advised us. Be away from it. You have to go get your chips. You have an aisle that has alcohol, an aisle that has chocolate or whatever the case is. Go the other aisle. I'm not going to drink, bro. Come on, man. Come on, bro. I know. Just fish tiny bo. Just do your best. Stay away from it. The commercial comes up. Don't watch it. Don't watch. Brother, are you... Don't watch it. You think the ones who do drugs today, they thought they will do drugs today? Do you think the ones who drank alcohol today, they thought they will drink alcohol? Wallahi, many of them did not. And if you think otherwise, then you need to learn more about the people around you. Many people never thought. I dealt with people on a personal level. One guy said it was one bad day and I just got into it. Wallahi, one time I went to a funeral of a brother and he was sitting and he was out took some drugs and he was out. I sat, spoke to him, what's the matter? He was just down. So if you're down, you have difficulties, I pray to Allah to ease things for you. But there are other avenues that can recover you from that difficulty than using drugs and alcohol. May Allah grant us wisdom, say Ameen. Especially our brothers, you have to be very cautious, both, but especially brothers, may Allah grant us wisdom, Ameen Rabbil Alameen. What else was revealed? What else did Allah reveal? Here, if you notice something, 
Allah does not want you to cover your heart, yes? Allah does not want you to cover your mind, yes? Allah does not want to cover your soul, yes? But much of society today, what does it want to do? It wants you to cover your mind, your heart, and your soul. In society today, it's very opposite to what Allah wants. Allah wants you to uncover your soul, but cover your body. Society today says, no, we want you to uncover your body, but cover your mind. May Allah grant us wisdom. Say, I mean. So Allah reveals a verse, and this is customized. And then here, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nabi, O Prophet of Allah. Yes. Qul, say. Say to whom? Li azwajik. What does that mean? Wives. Also specific to the wives, only to the Prophet? No, continue. Wa What does that mean? Your daughters. Also, it's only wives and daughters? La. Wa nisa'il mu'mineen. And all believing women. Yes, ya Allah, what do you want us to do? Yudinina alayhinna min jalabi bihin. The command has come. Sisters were not wearing no jilbab or anything close to that in terms of complete covering like that. But now the ruling comes. Min jalabi bihin. A cover from head that will drop and cover you head to toe. And one of the mistakes that we have, may Allah make it easy on all of us, say ameen, is that we think and some of us may feel like, oh, the one here is not covering her hair. And that's incorrect, very incorrect statement to make. Why? Because many times the hijab was limited to the hair, correct? And that's all what we show. And that's all what we enforce or advise or suggest. And that's completely wrong. They say, as long as my hair is covered and I cover my behind, that's what matters. No, no, absolutely not. When one of the sisters, she went to the Prophet wasallam in the seerah of the Prophet, he said, and there's difference of opinion about what he said was an exception. There's a difference of opinion of what he said was an exception. So he told one of the sisters, a woman is to cover herself completely. Illa hadha, except her face, wa hadha. And he pointed at the hand. That, and that's what we learn from Allah. What did Allah say? When he said, il mu'mineen, believing woman. The ones who trust Allah's judgment. This is what Allah wants. And I know it can be very difficult on some of us. I know it can be very difficult. May Allah make it easy. And don't let shaitan talk to you out of it. Don't let shaitan tell you all what matters is the heart. As long as it's pure, that's what matters. But did you not know what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, a pure heart is translated into actions. إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ don't let shaitan whisper to you and say, you know what, you know what, I might lose my job. No, look go what the Prophet said. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said some people, yuhramu rizq will be taken away the provision from them, be them bin yusiba, due to the disrespect or disobedience to Allah. May Allah make it easy. You understand it can be difficult. Don't let shaitan or others talk to you out of it. No, it's this problem and that problem. It doesn't make sense. Well, it's specific to the wives and the daughters. La, nisa al mu'mineen. May Allah make us believing men and women. Say, I mean, all these things to appreciate. And I completely feel you to an extent, not 100% of the difficulty this can happen. But as long as you obey Allah, Wallahi, Allah will not let you down. Did you get that sentence? Or once again, I should repeat it. Repeat it again. There is no way on earth you obey Allah and you get humiliated. Never, Wallahi, it will never happen. When you obey Allah, Allah dignifies you. And the day we disrespect Allah or disobey Allah, we will be humiliated. And the struggle is real. And the talk is not just to the ones who don't wear it completely but also the ones who wear it properly. You know what jilbab means? It means it's loose. Wasi'. Jilbab means it's long, tawil. Jilbab means it's not see-through, laysa shaffaf. So you have to be very watchful. May Allah grant us wisdom. And the call here and the attack that is coming is against the ones who are actually wearing it. How? I shared it in the conference and will share it again for those who are not attending. I went to one city. I gave a lecture and I saw a sister coming wearing the proper, mashallah, tabarakallah, dress coding of the sisters. May Allah make it easier for all the sisters. I mean, she came and she wants to talk and she starts to cry. She talks and she starts to cry. Felt bad. So her friend comes, helps her out. She tells me, can I tell you what my friend wants to say? I said, if she approves, she approves, go ahead. Then she says, well, my friend here, then her friend starts speaking. She says, listen, bro. listen, brother. Okay, 
I'm wearing this hijab and everything, but I'm struggling to keep it on. Why? She says, I have friends of mine who don't wear hijab, don't wear the proper jilbab, and they look gorgeous and on campus. They look beautiful. And honestly, yes, they may grab attention of the opposite gender and just human nature. You cannot, in a way, appreciate, not that you're looking for it or uh, desperate for it, but just that you, you feel like you're valued in a way, that you're a human being, whatever the case is. And we do not disrespect what she's saying. May Allah grant us wisdom, say I mean. And she's crying. She cannot barely finish the sentence. So what's your question? My question, brother, is this. Is it okay if that is the only command of Allah that I let go of? Can I just take it off? That's the only one thing. There's a lot that we spoke about of comfort and بإذن الله may Allah keep her steadfast. Say Amin. And all of us. But one of the things I try to share with and I share with you all is that the moment you let go of one of Allah's commands intentionally is just a snowball effect the other commands will eventually let be let go of. So I warn you from the footsteps of shaitan, shaitan is patient, shaitan is slick. May Allah grant us wisdom. She appreciated that, we spoke of you think, alhamdulillah, the tears went away, strong, may Allah keep us steadfast, that's key. I want to add to the story and continue just to kind of prove my point right here. And you're like, well, I'm different. I understand, but we give you some real life stories to appreciate. Another sister comes. Proper, mashallah, tabarakallah, proper hijab, all right? Remember, hijab is not just the covering of their, the way Allah revealed it. Basically, the way Allah revealed it was much more than that. She comes, she asks me a question. In the conference, I don't think I shared the question. I'll share it with you. She asked me a question. Can a Muslim woman marry a non-Muslim man? And usually a question like that, usually most people are aware of it, correct? And Allah allowed the Muslim woman to be married to a Muslim man. That's the option that Allah has given. Anything besides that is against Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, fine. As I spoke with the sister, I asked her a question. I said, I want to ask you a question, and if you don't mind, yani, let me know the answer. It's up to you. Why am I asking the questions? Because that's what she said first. She said, brother, by the way, I'm wearing this jilbab just because of your lecture. And I appreciate that. Respect, I appreciate that. I just hope that that will be your case always, right? When you go in public and so on. So when she said that, that's when my two questions came. I said, you took it off? She said, about a month and a half ago. I said, feel free to be honest. I know the answer. I know the answer. But I said, today, you don't feel any better than a month and a half ago. She looked down, she said, yes. It didn't make her feel any better, rather she felt worse. But even if she said yes, because Allah said, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً Banka. We know, alhamdulillah, Allah says, whoever is away from the path of Allah, their life won't be as successful or as great. May Allah grant us all greatness, dunya and akhirah, life and afterlife. So I said, can I ask you one more question? It's completely up to you. So we can, this is for educational purposes to advise her with her question. You see how her question came about? So I said, the assumption is that once you let go of the hijab a month and a half ago, I'm assuming some obligations eventually you had a hard time doing when you never had the hard time with in the past. And she shocked me with the answer. I knew the answer Allah knows best in this situation. It might be yes. But she said, yes, I'm struggling with my salah. The pillar of Islam is on the verge of falling. See, I'm struggling with salah. So the point that the, she's emphasizing with this ayah, all this to learn, is that you're like, oh, this is no big deal. No, don't you ever utter a word like that from your mouth, ever. It's no big deal to dedicate five, ten minutes on this. No. Allah says, وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنَا Allah says, you're taking the disobedience of Allah light. وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عظيم. Allah said, to me, it's serious. So we say we're struggling. We say we're going to try. But we never say it's no big deal. May Allah grant us wisdom. May Allah protect us. And may Allah ease it on all of us. Brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters, when the alcohol came of the prohibition, many of them dumped their cases of alcohol and they let go of it. Some Sahaba, they were holding the cup of alcohol, holding it. 
But the narration came, they didn't even finish that sip. And when this revelation came about the hijab and the jilbab, the sisters did not have some at home. They had to go purchase or so, or whatever the case may be, or adjust it. They took the sheets they have at their homes, and from there they heard and they obeyed. May Allah make it easy on all of us. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. So these were just two things to share with you. However, brothers and sisters, Aisha radiallahu anha, a believing, wonderful sister. Phenomenal. May Allah allow us to see her in Jannah. Say Ameen. Heard and obeyed the commands of Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu And one time, brothers and sisters, as the Prophet sallallahu was heading back to Medina, so this is an event after the revelation of hijab and alcohol and so on, they were going back to Medina. The Prophet typically would travel with his wife. That's his tradition. And the wife that joined the Prophet sallallahu in this journey was Aisha, may Allah be pleased by her. Fantastic. When Aisha radiallahu anha, she was with the Prophet going back to Medina, what happened? They took rest, like a rest area. And Aisha says, I used to sit in like a haudaj. A haudaj is like a, a small canopy, like a portable tiny room that is placed on the camel, right? You have like four men carrying from one end, second, third, fourth, and then they carry her to the camel and drop her down like that. And that's how Aisha used to sit in that. So Aisha radiallahu anha was in that canopy, and then when they went to rest, the brothers, the companions, they came and gently placed on the ground, and then Aisha walked out to relax. Aisha said, I had to go use the bathroom. And you have to appreciate something. It's not just simply, I gotta use the bathroom just like that, it's here and there. It was in a desert, open desert. So she had to walk really far, away from the sight of men and women to be able to utilize the bathroom or the washroom and relieve herself. So she walked all the way there. She finished, she did her thing, then she came all the way back to the Muslim camp. But then she realized, oh, I left my necklace. She was wearing a necklace, she perhaps changed her clothing or whatever the case was, and the necklace stayed there. So now she had to walk all the way back and when she went all the way back, walked until no one can see her, she picked up the necklace and then she came all the way back where? To the Muslim, what? Camp. When she arrived to the camp, she was shocked. She never thought the Muslims would leave because the Prophet did say, get ready, we're leaving. So she went and she thought she would come back in time to leave with them. But when the Prophet said, get ready, and she noticed the necklace was not with her, she came back and all of them left. You may say, Tayyib, when the brothers carried the haudaj, the canopy, the small tent or so, did they not feel Aisha was not there? Aisha says in authentic narration, I used to be very skinny. She said, and the women at that time were very skinny. They usually barely had any food, especially early Medina. The Muslims were not having all the luxury and so on. May Allah keep us humble, say Ameen. May Allah make us grateful, say Ameen. So I just said I was so skinny. Why? That means when they carried that thing, they would not tell if Aisha was in it or not. That's how skinny she used to be. So Aisha, she was left behind. She said, I will stay at my place. And eventually the Prophet will know his wife is not with him. So she stayed. The night came. She said, then I fell asleep. All of a sudden, a man by the name of Safwan, may Allah be pleased by him. He comes he, at night. What was he doing? Some said perhaps he was someone responsible to be at the end of the army. And some said he actually slept in and then he woke up and now he's walking towards joining the Muslims. As he was walking, he notices Aisha. And he says that sentence. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raj'un. To Allah we belong and to Allah we shall return. That was his reaction. He's shocked. Aisha said, and he knew I'm the wife of the Prophet. Then, then I covered my face. Side point, side point. I was like, should I say it or not? But no, we'll say it, inshallah. Wallahi, because of how our sisters who wear the niqab suffer from the Muslims. Suffer from within the Muslim community. Aisha's preference, Aisha, no, Aisha was the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, and she were to cover her face. And that's what she did. That's what the Prophet ﷺ wanted off of her. So if someone prefers that, don't be their enemy. Fair enough? 
It's just so hurting to us that you go around and whatever the case is and the first ones to fight it are Muslim themselves. And we have to be firm. And you know me, I wish nothing but the best for all of you. And I, bi'idhnillah, I'm optimistic that you trust me. That when things about Islam is spoken about, you need to stay in your lane. So for you to start saying, well, this is not part of Islam, you need to watch what you're saying because you would not open your mouth if it was something about medicine, if it's something about engineering, or if even something to do with a sub. Do a sandwich. You won't even get into it. I don't know. So why in Islam do you dare and have the audacity to speak about it? May Allah protect us. Say, I mean, you don't know, just say, I don't know. Fair enough, I will look more into it. So the point being for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, they had a higher a level of obligation to do that. And that was specific to them. And that's when I told you there was a difference of opinion about the other sisters, which we respect both opinions. Fair enough? So number three, Safwan radiallahu an, he leads Aisha back to Medina. He brings down his camel. Then Aisha comes, she rides on the camel, and then Safwan walks. So far, so good. May Allah be pleased by both of them. As they're walking and walking and walking, and Aisha was riding on the camel, the camp of the Muslims rested again. You're with me? Rested again. And now I'm going to another narration where a guy by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, one of the leaders of the hypocrites at the time, he saw Aisha and Safwan. He said, who's, who's this lady? They said, this is the mother of who? The believers. The wives of the Prophet are the mother of the believers. He said, who's this guy? Safwan. Oh. So they spent the night together. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, a young guy, a young girl. That's why he's saying, shuvah filth. Look at the filth. May Allah not make us fall for it. Say, I mean. May Allah not make us say stuff like that in today's dunya. Say, I mean. He says, look, a young girl, young guy, all alone, spending the whole night together. Wallahi ma salima minha wa ma salima minha. There's no way nothing happened. And that's it. He, just, he didn't say, they did this. But shuf, shuf, slick. So if someone says, how dare you say that? I didn't say anything. I said, you know, you know just like, you know, an educated guess. You know, just, just a thought. Like, I'm just saying, right? I, I wasn't explicit. He said that. And the rumors spread. And Aisha did not know. Aisha then, radiallahu anha, she arrived back to Medina. And she, when she arrived, she became sick. You know how many of us travel, we come back home, and we end up being sick? May Allah cure all those who are sick today. Say, I mean, may Allah ease anyone, because we heard some people have operations and surgeries. May Allah make it a successful one. Say, I mean, and may Allah make whatever hardship that you go through, whether a headache or a prick of a thorn or being hit by the door or a, the, the seat handle or whatever. May Allah make all of that means of your purification from any shortcomings that you've done. Say, I mean, Aisha becomes sick. She has no clue what's going on. Then Aisha one time, she said, after many weeks, I was very sick. Eventually, I start feeling better as a month was approaching. She said, then I, f I left to go use the bathroom. And I walked with one of the sisters who was the mother of a man by the name of Mistah. We walked together, walked together. And then the mother of Mistah, she tripped. She tripped. So she said, may Allah curse Mistah. Aisha said, why do you say that about the brother? Look at the sister defending the honor of the brother. He attended one of the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. Don't you speak ill about the brother. May Allah allow us to defend each other like that. Say, I mean, the way Aisha did. She didn't say, if I say that about him, people will think I like him. Let them think whatever they think. If you have to defend the brother, then so be it. Allah is the judge, not the people. May Allah allow us to be wise of what words to say. Say, I mean. She said, don't say that about Mustafa. He's a good brother. She said, what are you talking about? You know what he's been doing, right? You know what's going around the whole city of Medina. She said, what are you talking about? Aisha, have no idea. What's going on? The rumors, rumors. You know, I've been sick for weeks, almost a month. She said, Aisha, people are saying like, you and Safwan must have done something. What? Aisha becomes aware of it. She gets so upset, she gets so angry. She goes back home. Do you guys notice something? Throughout the whole month, Aisha could not tell from the Prophet when he walked into the house. You guys notice that now, huh? The Prophet can't just pass judgments like that. 
He can't just say, oh yeah, I heard it, how dare you? Do? May Allah protect us and grant us wisdom. So then Aisha was very frustrated. She couldn't believe what's happening. She said, I continued to cry and cry and cry and cry. Until I, she went home, she saw the Prophet ﷺ. She felt the Prophet was not showing her the typical, so high level of love that he typically does. He, didn't, he never cursed her, a'udhu billah. But it's not his usual. He said, kayfa tikum. So how are you guys over there doing? Usually he says, ya Aish. Sweet words and things like that, right? But she's now picking up a few things from the Prophet. Then she talks to her mom. Mom, is it true? Aisha goes to her mom. Mom, is this true? She said, yeah, Aisha. Listen, listen. She have mothers. Huh? May Allah grant them Jannah. May Allah grant all our mothers Jannah. Aisha, when there is a beautiful woman like you, marrying Muhammad, وسلم, it's only normal that the wives and will be jealous of her. Don't worry about this. So it's true. <laughs> so the rumors are true. And you heard about it. So then she went and she said to cry and cry and cry. The Prophet ﷺ deep in his heart. And he goes verbalize it to the people. Telling the people pretty much in summary to stop saying stuff like that. He gave a sermon. People amongst us are hurting me and my family. What do you guys think of that? Meaning stop it. But then the Prophet ﷺ goes home. And then Aisha goes home. She sees the Prophet ﷺ. And she sees her mom and dad. And the Prophet ﷺ tells her something. What is he saying? He said, Ya Aisha, I want to tell you something. After he praised Allah and everything, he said, Aisha, listen. If you were innocent, if you were innocent, Allah will show the world that you're innocent. Fair enough? Then he said, وَإِن كُنْتِ أَلْمَمْتِ بِذَنْبَ And if you did a sin, then return back to Allah with repentance and seek His forgiveness, for Allah forgives the past when you repent. Aisha got so offended. Like you actually giving me the option, like if I did this or did that? Then Aisha said, I know for a fact. If I told you I'm innocent, I don't think you guys will believe me. But if I told you I'm guilty, I did do it, you will all believe me. Then she said, I will say what Jacob, Yaqub, the father of Yusuf said. What did he say? فَصَبْرٌ jamil." I will have beautiful patience. What's beautiful patience? Beautiful patience is the type of patience where you do not complain to the creation, but only complain to the creator. She said, I'm not complaining to no one. I'm going to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah knows I'm innocent. Look at the certainty that Allah will show her innocence. Then Aisha, she said, I went, I lied down, and she said, I knew for a fact Allah will show my innocence. May Allah grant us certainty like Aisha. Say, Ameen. Brother, sister, we learn from this wonderful lady. Then Aisha said, while the Prophet was there in the room with Abu Bakr and the wife of Abu Bakr, the Prophet ﷺ started to what? sweat. What does that mean? What does that mean? Revelation is coming. She said, Aisha, it was a cold day, but that's how revelation happens. Start sweating, and that's one of the proofs of prophethood. Sweating, sweating so much, so much. And we all said, he's getting something, he's getting revelation. And all of a sudden, after the revelation was done, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Aisha, Allah has revealed your innocence. Allah said you're innocent. And Allah said, this whole thing is a false accusation. There's a lot that happened. Then Aisha said, Alhamdulillah, she was grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, you know what Allah said? There's a lot. I'll show you one thing, inshallah. Allah says, Inna ja'u bil ifk. Allah says, the ones who spread the rumors. He said, ifk. What does ifk mean? This whole thing is false accusation. Allah says, Usbatun minkum. There are people from within, hypocrites. The ones who initiated this thing. Then he said, and I want you all your undivided attention. We're coming into the session. I got your undivided attention on top. Thumbs up, thumbs up, all, all in. You ready for what Allah said? لا تحسبوه شرا لكم. Allah is telling Aisha, the Prophet and the believers, do not think what happened is bad. What? How? لا, you ask with respect. You wonder with respect. Allah says it's not bad, it's not bad. Not because you are not using your intellect, because you're using your intellect and trusting the all-wise. 
Then Allah says, Bal huwa, rather it is good for you. So Allah has double emphasized it. When Allah said it's not bad, and what does it mean? It's good. But in case you want more emphasis, it's not bad, rather it's good. Brothers and sisters, if the only good thing that happened out of this whole accusation is to show the whole world that the Prophet وسلم, does not write the Quran on his own because this took over a month long. Isn't that enough of a benefit to the world, yes or no? To show that the Quran is revelation because the Prophet وسلم, or someone who's faking to be a Prophet could have made up something. The ones who said this uh, punished them with such and such lashes and put them in prison for like three, five. He could have did something from day one. No, from the first second someone uttered that sentence, yes or no? Over a month, surely this man is a prophet, receives revelation. If the only benefit that came from this is to show the whole world the status of Aisha, Quran was revealed because of her, isn't that enough of a benefit? Yes or no? Agreed? If the only benefit that came out of this accusation is to expose the hypocrites, isn't that enough of a benefit? So many times in life you may not see the good into something that may be so difficult, but I swear by the one who made you a swearing that Allah will hold me accountable for, oh my believing brothers and sisters, Allah wants nothing but greatness to you. Allah wants nothing but the best to every one of you. The Prophet said amazing is the state of the believer. Everything that happens to the believer is good for them. If they face a hardship, two options. You face a hardship and you were patient, that is good for you. And if you face sarra, a blessing, and you are grateful, then that is good for you. And it happens across the board. All of us saw hardships in our lives, yes or no? Just by a show of hands, maybe one, maybe two, anybody here faced a hardship and then saw the wisdom of how it's good? Allahu Akbar. Great, hands were raised. Question, any of you here saw a hardship, but until today, you don't know the wisdom? Yeah, raise your hand, it's okay, it's haram. <laughs> ah. At times, Allah shows you the wisdom. Strengthen your faith and make you not question Allah again. And at times, Allah will not show you the wisdom to test your faith. A sister, I may have shared it to you two years ago or so, emails me. I'm going to commit suicide. La ilaha illallah. What's the matter? And I made a video, a short video. May Allah grant her Jannah. Say Ameen. She said, I loved this guy since I was a teenager. I prayed to Allah every single day to get married to this man. Every day, brother. Ya Allah, make me marry this man. Six years later, six years, every day, make me marry this man. She said, but guess what happened, brother? This guy ended up getting engaged to someone else. I will kill myself, Allah hates me. Why would Allah do that to me? I prayed every day for this. Brothers and sisters, when you pray to Allah for something, what does it mean? Oh Allah, I want this. It means if it's good, grant it. And whatever dua that you make, Allah will reward you. So if Allah did not give you what you asked for, how does Allah respond? Pushing away a harm that was coming your way. But what if he does not do one, give me what I ask for? What if he does not push a hardship away? What would Allah give me? Third option, Allah will transform your good deeds, your dua into good deeds on the day of judgment. On the scale where it measures your good and the bad deeds. And that dua that was not responded in a way that it gave you what you asked for, did not protect you from a hardship, Allah will now make it into hasanat the day you want it so bad. The best currency. So which of the three options are the best ones? Which one? It is whatever Allah sees best. Maybe what makes us go to Jannah is option one. Is Allah giving me what I asked for? Sometimes it's not one or three. It's me being protected from that hardship, a calamity that was coming. So this sister, she said, Wallahi, I kid you not. She said in the email, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, it didn't work out. Subhanallah, why Alhamdulillah now? Did it, it seems like things made sense to you now. Do you have to wait for you to find the wisdom of something to accept it from Allah? La. She said that guy was exposed drinking alcohol and cheating on his fiancée. See, didn't have to wait. Just submit to Allah. 
May Allah grant us wisdom. May Allah grant her a righteous spouse. Say, I mean, brothers and sisters, and Allah revealed the innocence of Aisha. Tayyib. With that being said, there's a few things we'll talk about, inshallah, very important events. But we need Brother Osama to come up and give us some announcements.